Welcome everyone. I'm Joya Van Cherry, the Education Coordinator at the Louisiana AAP. Today we are working in partnership with Aetna Better Health of Louisiana to present pediatric oral health and fluoride varnish application in the clinic. Um, Dr. Steve Bienvenu will be our presenter today. Um, we're gonna go through some of the announcements real quick um, and then we will get going. Um, so I have our disclosures. Dr. Bienvenu has no relevant financial relationships and one of our committee members, Dr. Bocchini, um, received grant funds from Regeneron and Novavax and sits on the advisory board of Pfizer and Dynavax. Um, all remaining faculty, edu education committee members and staff have no relevant financial relationships and all relationships have been mitigated. Um, our credit statement, we are accredited by Louisiana, Texas Medical, or not Louisiana, we are accredited by the Texas Medical Association to provide continuing medical education for physicians. Louisiana AAP has designated this live activity for one AMA PRA category one credit and physicians should only claim, claim credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. Please go ahead and check in by sharing your name and where you're from in the chat um, as some have already started to do. And be sure to remain on mute until the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, please send them in the chat throughout the, throughout the presentation. We will be monitoring the chat for questions and we'll begin the question and answer portion at the end of the presentation with any questions that have come through in the chat. Any questions that are remaining in the chat at the end of the activity will be answered through our follow-up email. Okay. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Bienvenu. Um, Dr. Bienvenu, do you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself as you get ready to share your presentation? Well, good morning. I'm a recently retired pediatrician and welcome from Shreveport. Uh, we're uh, very happy that uh, Aetna and, and the Louisiana uh, section of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, is having us uh, here to chat with you this morning about fluoride varnish and uh, pediatric oral health. Good morning to everyone at the AAP in Baton Rouge from Shreveport. Are you ready to get started? Yes, sir. Let's, let's do it. So, first of all, we'll, we'll get through our uh, initial uh, requirements here. Uh, please write down this uh, email address. I'll give it to you again later so that we can uh, uh, communicate later if uh, you so desire. Uh, and the relevant required uh, slides, I'm gonna buzz through here pretty quickly. Although this is an off-label use of our product, it's used in every state in the nation. It's been used in Europe for uh, 40 to 50 years now for other reasons. Uh, but let's let's look at a few things that we need to, to talk about. If our slides will stay stable here. There we go. Uh, perhaps we're getting there. Uh, perhaps uh, many, if not most of us this morning are, are people who care for children uh, who have Medicaid. Uh, so we'll show some, show you some uh, facts about these kids. Uh, and here uh, we can we can see the latest indicators as to how well we're doing in Louisiana. We're not doing very well. 48% of children in Medicaid received preventive dental care visit last year, less than half, and only a small fraction of kids six to 14 received a dental sealant on their permanent molars, which is very important. Uh, we give fluoride varnish, use it uh, routinely in this, in this state through age five, uh, which gives us some coverage. However, uh, we stop after age five uh, and uh, we're left to, uh, we leave our children to their own devices. They need to get their, their dental sealants and they're just not doing it. But that's Medicaid. The general population isn't doing a whole lot better. Uh, as you can see, although three quarters of them get received one 
preventive dental care visit in the last year, half of the third graders, more than half, have a dental caries experience already. And over a quarter of the third graders right now today have untreated dental decay. And only a quarter or less than a third of the third graders have dental sealants. So we really got a long way to go. Overall, the state receives a, a grade from the government uh, and those who uh, grade the states in terms of medical care, dental care of a D, as in Delta routinely, we need to do better. I know all of you have seen pictures like this in the clinic. Uh, we hate to see these things in our clinic. Uh, it's not fun. Uh, uh, they're terrible. They can not only result in uh, uh, current uh, problems with, uh, with misery and pain and uh, discomfort, but uh, they're dangerous. So these kids uh, suffer from distant infections uh, due to spread in the bloodstream and worst of all, perhaps uh, brain abscesses. But this can be easily prevented and we need to get with it and do so in our state. Now, that's not to say that many clinics aren't using fluoride varnish in our state. Fluoride varnish uh, definitely uh, reduces the, the incidence of cavities, dental decay in your patients. If you use it, we've been using it for, for 14 years now, uh, uh, for a few years before the state started paying for it which they do, and, uh, and they pay pretty well. Uh, and it's transformed the oral health of the kids in our clinic. When we first began, uh, most of the children in our clinic, which is largely Medicaid, had dental decay. It's very obvious and pretty awful. After a few years of beginning fluoride varnish in our clinic, we noticed that these things were going away. And before long, we just didn't see dental decay in our, in our office. It was truly amazing. And we're very gratified and very happy that this has occurred because supplying fluoride varnish in your clinic requires minimal time. It's, it's, it's just so easy. We don't even think about it anymore. We just do it. Uh, so let's talk about how we got to where we are today. Uh, when I was growing up and still to a certain extent, the dentists expect that children will eventually appear in their offices with a problem, just like adults do. But that's not the best way to start. As pediatricians, we're all about prevention and dentists to their, uh, I have to say, uh, they are definitely trying to do better with more preventive care in their offices and they're seeing more children. But as, as pediatricians, we need, we need to let everyone know, and certainly we need to recognize that uh, dentists uh, are not pediatricians, and pediatricians require pediatric uh, training and a pediatric staff and an office that's set up to take care of children. Pediatric dentists require the same thing. So things are getting better, but uh, they haven't improved 100%. Uh, we still got a way to go, and we all know that they are not dentists in every parish in Louisiana. So as doctors, uh, many or most of us tell the parent, well, go to the dentist. You need to go take your kids to the dentist. Uh, if we remember to say that, uh, but we need to do better. We tend to look in the mouth and the throat and we're looking for other pathologies and we ignore the teeth. Parents tend to expect that the baby teeth will fall out and they do eventually beginning at perhaps six years of age. Uh, and if they get infected or have a problem, why worry about it? They're going to fall out anyway. Uh, but we all know that infected teeth and damaged baby teeth are primary first teeth that we see uh, are living and protecting our eventual secondary adult teeth that are forming uh, next to these teeth. So. We need to keep that space healthy. And they're, so they're extremely important to care for. Uh, that's not been done so much in the past and uh, we need to do better. Uh, no question that we can do better and uh, it's easy to do. 
So about 15 years ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics began a large oral health initiative to get pediatricians to pay a little bit more attention to kids' teeth and try to get everyone started providing fluoride varnish on kids' teeth because it really cuts down on dental caries. But most people don't know that the beginning of this uh, began with the ADA approaching uh, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and funding uh, a large amount, uh, if not most of the cost of this oral health initiative. So the pres presidents of both the AAP and the ADA appeared at the national convention and exhibition uh, and a special session and addressed a large uh, company of pediatricians urging them to get started. So this is just not simply a pediatric effort. The ADA and dentists uh, are also behind this. So we not only have the purview to apply voral or, or, or fluoride varnish, uh, uh, you have the backing of both groups. So pretty quickly, although it started in North Carolina uh, in about uh, 2000 or so, uh, it rapidly spread across the country. And now all 50 states in, in the US uh, have Medicaid systems that support the, the application of fluoride varnish uh, by physicians. And they support it through direct payments uh, to their physicians. So it's not something that, uh, that is new. Uh, so let's talk about a few things that we need to uh, uh, know about uh, and be aware of again and remind ourselves of. The word caries is the process of decay. It's not uh, a synonym uh, or another noun for uh, a hole in the tooth, which we, uh, we call colloquially as a, uh, a cavity. Uh, but decay is always progressive. Uh, it's very aggressive in young children. And in early childhood caries, remember caries is the process of disease, it's so aggressive that pediatric dentists will tell you that if you see the first sign of decay and nothing is done in a very young child, in a year, that tooth will disappear. It will be gone. And finally, the most important thing we need to remember today is that this process of caries is an infectious disease. Uh, the teeth aren't infected themselves, but they live uh, in saliva and uh, they suffer microfilms on their surfaces that are full of streptococcus mutans, uh, which is the primary producer of the acid that causes tooth decay. It's as simple as that. There are other also RANs, but streptococcus mutant, mutans is number one. So where do children get this? Well, they get it usually from their mothers or whoever the caretaker is very early in life, probably uh, beginning in the very first few weeks of life, but certainly in, in those months, uh, first several months of life. Uh, and the more bacteria they carry in their mouths, the more it's transferred from the caretaker, the higher the risk of dental caries. And so the earlier a child is colonized, the higher the risk that this child is gonna suffer from decay. Now, we've all seen parents uh, place uh, the pacifier in their own mouths in our clinics and then return it to the baby's mouth. Now, we don't wanna do that. Now, this man has been pulled over by the dental police and uh, clearly, uh, He's about to get a ticket for, uh, for putting the pacifier, his baby's pacifier in his own mouth. So whatever his dental flora is, and to a certain extent, whatever his dental history is, he's about to transfer it to his baby. So here's the most important image you're going to see today, besides uh, those that have to do with applying fluoride varnish is this, this is called the Stefan curve, just like the name, the Stefan curve. And all dental students uh, uh, know all about this curve. Uh, production of acid is what causes dental decay. 
and decay is simply the demineralization of the enamel on our teeth. In acid conditions, the enamel on our teeth demineralizes and cavities eventually are the result. So it's this simple. Uh, when, we, when we eat food, uh, our, the pH in our mouth very rapidly descends below this magic number of 5.5, which you see over here on the right. Uh, and whenever it's below this line, uh, it goes across, which marks 5.5 pH, our teeth are demineralizing. So in 30 minutes or so uh, after we eat, uh, maybe our, our pH is able to buffer back up uh, thanks to saliva, which we'll talk about in a minute. And we get back into the safe zone and our teeth actually begin to remineralize. And this goes on all day. Uh, so as long as we have food or substrate for these bacteria that produce acid, uh, when they eat the same food we do, uh, we're going to have demineralization of our teeth. Uh, so if we graze all day, as you can see, uh, we're going to have a problem. So grazing is bad. We have to eat. So it's better to eat three meals a day and maybe have a couple of snacks carefully during the day, but try to keep your intake try to relegate it to those specific times uh, rather than multiple little events all day long. We see our kids uh, getting fed in our waiting rooms and grazing all the time, not good. So the frequency of our sugar ingestion is more important than the quantity. And if you don't believe that juice has sugar in it, uh, try to go to this uh, uh, one day to this uh, slide, uh, this image, uh, which is available on sugarstacks.com uh, and discover just how much sugar is in many of the foods that we ingest. Fortunately, the federal government is no longer giving away huge quantities of juice, which as pediatricians we all knew for years was a terrible idea. Uh, it has tons of sugar represented by the amount of sugar cubes in front of these. So, well, that, that's a problem. Try again, sorry. Okay. No, don't want that either. If you click from current slide, it's the second one Maybe. from the... Thank you. Okay, I think I'm back, sorry about that. Okay. So this is an important thing to, this is an important thing to remember. If you remember this, then you're essentially clued in as to what's happening and how it happens. Okay, so we've all had toothbrushing recommendations. When we were children, we had to brush three times a day or, or suffer death. Uh, now we know that uh, uh, the best recommendations are to brush twice a day. So we tell our parents two minutes twice a day. That's one of the very few things you need to remember to tell your parents. Uh, when they come in, uh, do you go to the dentist? When was the last time you go to the dentist? Or you went to the dentist? I always ask them that. Um, just take seconds, go home, brush two minutes, twice a day, and brush with fluoride toothpaste. Fluoride containing toothpaste from the very first, when your teeth first appear, uh, don't use Dr. So-and-so's organic toothpaste. It doesn't contain fluoride. Uh, use fluoride containing toothpaste. It's fine to use the same toothpaste that you and I use uh, uh, every day, uh, two minutes, twice a day. You're going to have to do the brushing. And from three to six years, uh, people say, well, maybe you can just supervise. I think you're a lot better off continuing the brushing and let your six-year-old help out a little bit. And maybe your four-year-old on the way, but they don't do a very good job until they get to be six or probably eight years of age, uh, keep an eye on things. Make sure at least every other day you're in there watching to make sure they're doing a good job. Make sure they're always using fluoridated toothpaste. These are the latest recommendations. Toothbrushing, well, we're going to use how much, 
how much toothpaste? Well, here it is. It's very simple. Uh, up until three years of age, uh, we're going to use just a smear. And I do mean a smear, just a thin layer that doesn't cover the whole toothpaste brush surface, just a little bit of a smear, not a body like this, uh, but a smear. So we're not going to use this volume. We want to make sure they don't get too much fluoride. It takes a very small amount, so long as we get it on every tooth. And uh, so we want to be careful. It's what we do every day that counts and good habits are what will save us here. So when a child gets to be three, current recommendations are to use a, a pea-sized amount. How big a pea? What a big pea or a little pea? Probably a little pea is good enough. Do not rinse. Don't rinse the mouth after brushing. Uh, kids will swallow more toothpaste and kids like to eat toothpaste. We all know that. Uh, and we can start varnishing every three to six months uh, at age six months with the first appearance of the first tooth. So these are the latest recommendations. So there are just a few things we need to train parents and remind parents. So uh, if you brush at least twice a day, we're good. But twice a day is enough. Uh, latest recommendations, two minutes twice a day. So two and two, two minutes twice a day. Fix that in your mind. It's easy to say, very fast. And after they've come in to visit us several times, and we've said this several times, they'll begin to remember it and do it too. Okay. Uh, food plus grazing is not good. So uh, no grazing. Uh, let's have our three meals a day. Let's have our cookies and things with the meals so that we observe the Stefan curve and avoid getting into those, falling into those holes that keep us uh, acid all day long. Don't want to be acidic. We want to recover between meals. And watch those uh, snacks. Folks recommend a couple of snacks a day, perhaps, but be careful and don't overdo it. Uh, try to keep your cookies and sweets uh, associated with the meals. That will help. Bottle in bed, make sure there's nothing in that bottle but water. Make sure there's nothing on your teeth uh, but water when you go to bed. Babies are children, uh, uh, no food. Make sure you uh, make that brush time uh, uh, bedtime activity. All this equals bad teeth if we don't do this. All this together with fluoride varnish is going to save us. So flossing, when do I floss? Parents will often ask you this. Uh, well, we begin to floss whenever two teeth touch. So whenever you notice uh, that two of your children's teeth are touching, it's time to start flossing. Now there's been some pushback on flossing among pediatric dentists uh, these days. So don't be surprised if flossing goes away with children. <coughs> it could happen. But these are the current recommendations. By the way, floss was invented by a New Orleans guy uh, in 1815. So well, that's our claim to fame there. Uh, saliva, we mentioned saliva earlier. Saliva is our savior. Uh, saliva is uh, our buffer. So we need normal quantities of saliva, good saliva, and, and it needs to move around. At night, uh, uh, we produce less saliva, so if we've got food stuff left on our teeth, that one more cookie before I go to bed, even though I've already brushed, is not good. Uh, because our flow decreases, so we don't soak the pillows. God had a pretty good design there, uh, but we've got to pay attention to how we handle that. Zero stomia. Some patients have zero stomia for various reasons. Biggest reason is us, uh, because how many of our asthma and allergy patients are on antihistamines and other medications that cause drying in the mouth. And any reduction in saliva at all puts us at a greater risk for tooth decay. So be aware. Remember, saliva is the buffer. So we want good amounts of saliva. Uh, we got to get that Stefan curve on our side as much of the time as we can. Saliva also carries, uh, carries with it there some enzymes and antibodies that are helpful. Uh, and finally, the tongue 
is an extremely important device in the mouth. The tongue is constantly cleaning uh, the teeth. So we need a tongue that works well and kids that don't have that, and we have some of those, uh, are at, at increased risk. Uh, so we know that some kids uh, are uh, suffering from issues that definitely increase their risk of, of dental caries. Uh, we talked about medications that cause dry mouth. We all know as pediatricians, pediatricians who see lots of premature children, uh, they have a very high incidence of abnormal teeth and abnormal uh, enamel. Uh, so they are at increased risk to keep a, uh, uh, an active eye on those teeth. Uh, children with congenital heart disease are at risk from systemic infection. They often have right to left shunts, which uh, allows uh, uh, blood to get into the systemic system and travel throughout the body without the filtering action of, of the lungs. We all know all about that. But also, uh, there's no question that uh, any kind of uh, congenital heart disease, any kind of congenital disease or significant uh, health problem that attracts attention of physicians also causes the parents to tend to focus on that. And both the doctors and the parents I've seen tend to forget about routine care. So uh, make sure you uh, don't forget about the routine care of children and care for their teeth uh, who have uh, congenital or uh, serious uh, uh, generalized disease. And kids with cerebral palsy are a terrible problem. Many of them have significant trismus, can't open their mouths, uh, and the parents just can't seem to get to the teeth and quickly give up. They have terrible dentition. I uh, pray that uh, uh, your location has a dentist who will see all of the kids with cerebral palsy. It's really tough. Try everything you can to get some fluoride varnish on these kids' teeth when they come in. It's well worth doing. Uh, so well, what are fluoride sources? We need to know that there are fluoride sources besides us and besides parents uh, brushing our kids' teeth with fluoride toothpaste. Uh, and we need to know that for a couple of reasons. But community water fluoridation uh, uh, has been a boon in our country, but we know we have some anti-fluoridators uh, now, uh, as well as the other anti-groups. And, uh, and so fluoridation has actually taken something of a hit. We're certainly not uh, routinely fluoridated in this, uh, in this state or anywhere else in the country. Uh, so I'm grateful for those places that are uh, helping our kids and our adults with fluoridated water. Uh, but it's important to know that uh, as well as physicians, since we may be asked to uh, give patients uh, supplements, uh, parents will come in and ask, uh, gee, I, I need some fluoride drops for my child. We live out in the country, uh, so we don't have city water. It's very important to know that, uh, uh, that, that fluoride is a very ubiquitous element. It's found in, in soil. It's not a chemical. It's an element. Uh, so it's found in the ground, found in bodies of water, plants, foods, uh, and therefore well water and normal constituent of all of our diets. So uh, it's, uh, it's been around for a long time. And although some foods are naturally high in fluoride, the biggest problem as a physician is, is the risk of giving someone supplements who is on well water or has an unknown, unrecognized source of fluoride and causing fluorosis. Fluoride varnish has never been associated with fluorosis, fortunately. But uh, it can happen if you're giving supplements or uh, this child is ingesting uh, two months, uh, too much fluoride from other sources, including natural sources. Uh, naturally, uh, uh, Louisiana is not exempt from natural sources. All of the green circles are natural sources uh, of fluoride locations uh, that exist without the state. These are the ones uh, that we know of. As you can see, there's one down uh, near Baton Rouge. And what is the largest uh, city in the uh, state that uh, 
does not have fluoridated water, uh, Baton Rouge. Uh, their system is not fluoridated. However, there are a number of uh, sources of water around Baton Rouge that are naturally fluoridated. The concentration may not be enough. And in some places, however, the concentrations in some of these areas are too high and people are likely to develop fluorosis uh, due to all the natural and social sources of, of fluoride that uh, uh, people are exposed to on an everyday basis. In fact, the fact that fluoride can reduce uh, dental caries in, in uh, children and adults uh, uh, occurred, uh, uh, was discovered when the government sent a couple of dental researchers uh, to a small town known as Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, many years ago to find out why all the people there had black teeth. They, in fact, they were known by other uh, local folks uh, in the state as the black teeth people. Everybody in Colorado Springs tended to have stained teeth. It took them two years to discover that the reason was their source of water uh, had a, an extremely high uh, concentration of fluoride. And that's what was going on. This happened in another city and in the Northern United States as well. So uh, natural sources uh, abound. So please don't supplement anyone uh, without insisting on seeing uh, an assay of their well water, uh, their water source, uh, and many well waters occur. Uh, make sure you know what you're doing. I never supplement uh, uh, kids. Uh, it's just too risky. Many of the pediatric uh, dentists that I spoke to uh, uh, have told me the same thing. Okay. So the state wants us to uh, lift the lip. The AAP wants us to do this, and the ADA wants us to do this. They want us to look at the teeth and look for obvious problems. Uh, obvious problems are just that. They're easy to see. And if we see an obvious problem, our directive is to compel this uh, caretaker to take their child to the dentist. Don't mess around, just go to the dentist. Fluoride varnish can reverse the earliest signs of uh, dental decay, uh, but it will not uh, have an effect on decay itself uh, that has already produced a cavity. So here you see white spots. White spots are the earliest form of decay. So this child is already in trouble. Uh, the white spots you can see here as, as irregular bands that are near the base of the teeth, near the contact with the teeth where the teeth meet the gums, typically where they first occur. You'll also notice some brown spots, but these brown spots aren't spots at all. These are actually where the, the white area has given way to complete penetration of the enamel. The enamel is gone and you're looking at the dentin. Uh, too late there. Uh, fluoride varnish, if, if applied uh, by a pediatric dentist, generally speaking, because we want to send these kids immediately to a dentist. Uh, uh, once we see white spots, any gross abnormality that appears to be associated with decay, they need to go to the dentist. The fluoride varnish can actually reverse these white spots and result in normal teeth. But there, to do that, it often has to be applied uh, on a weekly basis for several weeks. It will not affect decay that has produced a cavity, okay? So the process here is caries, and these are cavities. Uh, these are white spots. And this is what we're gonna look for. If we see rotten teeth or teeth that are in the process of decay, send them to the dentist. That's all the state asked for, and they're gonna pay for doing this and pay for talking to our, our patients, and they're going to reimburse us for applying fluoride varnish. Okay, so when we look at teeth, we just look for early signs of decay. We look for white spots here. You can see some more white spots. You look carefully. And if you start looking for these in the clinic, you're going to see them, okay? Remember the brown spots aren't spots. They're actually holes in the teeth. Okay, uh, you'll see a menagerie of 
dental conditions. We saw this before we started fluoride varnish in our clinic. We saw this every day, all day long, not good. And when you have early childhood dental caries, uh, those teeth don't last very long. I know you all seen teeth like this. It happens and it happens very quickly. So it's not surprising that these kids are in, have chronic pain, don't do well in school, don't eat well, may have failure to thrive, uh, don't behave well at home. And uh, perhaps this contributes to some of the abuse we've seen. It's just very sad. Uh, it's not fun seeing kids with teeth like this, and especially not fun seeing them come in with dental abscesses. We stopped seeing all of that. It just went away for us. Occasionally, we still see a patient with a dental abscess, but when we looked, they weren't our patients. They were referred to us from out of the clinic, and uh, we were glad to see they came from elsewhere. Uh, they weren't getting fluoride varnish. Uh, so how does fluoride varnish work? You said it uh, cuts down tooth decay. Now, fluoride varnish catalyzes the remineralization of enamel. It's basically what it does. We're replacing that phosphate uh, combination with the calcium with fluoride. It lasts for uh, three or four months. Uh, uh, we know that. And so we'd like to get it on there uh, three or four times a year. We have to see the kid to do that. Uh, and hopefully, child is going to see a dentist in there. So I'll tell you how we manage that uh, in a little bit. It's very simple and requires almost nothing but a question. Uh, so it may arrest those white spots that we see going, but we don't try to do that. We send the child to the dentist right away. It does decrease the enamel solubility. As it says here and has some effect on the cariogenic organisms. And most remarkably and gratifyingly, it apparently concentrates itself in dental plaque and so those organisms that are operating beneath the plaque uh, are just out of luck. Uh, that part of the tooth also gets help and probably uh, it's part of the reason it's as effective as it is. It's not 100% effective, but it's very effective, effective enough that with a little bit of, of anticipatory uh, advice and care, uh, you can get rid of dental decay in your clinic. Now, the primary activity for this now is apparently topical. We used to think, well, you, you got fluoride in your mouth, you swallowed it, it went through your system and concentrated in the teeth. It doesn't work that way. Apparently the primary action is topical. So swish a little bit, <laughs> but uh, uh, Therefore, and thereof, uh, fluoride varnish is particularly effective. It lasts for three or four months, as I said earlier. Uh, that's why it has to be placed uh, uh, continuously to be most effective. Although even getting one dose uh, a year on those teeth is valuable, as we'll see uh, in a minute. So fluoride varnish is a sticky stuff made of a resin. Uh, it contains 22 times the concentration of fluoride in the toothpaste. And it truly is like a vaccine against tooth decay. And that's the way we consider it and operate with it in our clinic. We consider it just as important as our other vaccines. And we give it at the same time we give the other vaccines if it's time for a vaccine. We also use it uh, if the child is uh, in for a sick visit uh, and it's time for a vaccine. Uh, and it's time for fluoride varnish. If it's appropriate for fluoride varnish, in other words, child is not vomiting, and not too ill for it to be uh, inappropriate, we all always uh, try to give uh, that fluoride varnish uh, uh, at that time as well. Uh, child is vomiting or it seems inappropriate, uh, we don't do it. Uh, but uh, just like vaccines, we press hard to get this on our kids' teeth. Well, what are the rules? We said Medicaid and every state pays for it now, and it does. I and mean, we'll see what it pays in just a moment. The rules have been changed only once in the, the last, uh, uh, since 2012, when our program started uh, in our state. And they changed just uh, only in the way that uh, they allow 
uh, applicators in your clinic uh, to participate. And that was the addition of certified medical assistants. You must be a certified medical assistant, uh, but they may also now learn and be certified to apply the fluoride varnish in your clinic. So in our state, it's different in every state. Some states will allow you to apply it through age 21. Uh, in our state, uh, they focus only on young, youngest children and uh, they'll pay for us to do these things uh, for kids six months through five years of age. So they will not pay once the child becomes six years of age. They'll pay every six months, so it's twice a year. We like to get it on teeth every three or four months. So we hope that they'll go to the dentist at least once a year. And if we see them frequently, as we do as, uh, as pediatricians, hopefully we can get it on twice more in that year uh, or enough to get it on there several times and be most effective. Must be done during a regular visit, very important. Uh, you will not be paid if anyone believes you did this uh, not uh, or outside of a regular visit. Maybe a sick visit, maybe a well visit, but we can't have just varnish only visits. The training, uh, which is required to be paid, uh, consists only of an online module. It's very simple. You takes about uh, 35 minutes, uh, and then you pass a 10 question quiz and you're done. Application is normally delegated in, in clinics. Physicians are usually too busy to do this, although our residents will occasionally do it. Uh, but primarily, primarily other personnel do it, the nurses do it, uh, and they are extremely efficient with it. Uh, and it happens very fast. They like it because they know it's useful and it's powerful, and they don't have to type in long alphanumeric numbers or scan in numbers into the computer and links. So it's very fast, much faster than, than the operations and preparations are with vaccines. Uh, but all of these people uh, in your clinic may do it. Nurse practitioners, PAs, advanced practice uh, RNs, your RNs, your LPNs. And again, since 2017, certified MAs can do it. So if you have these folks in your clinic, uh, make sure everybody gets trained and is certified and send their certificates to all the, the MCOs. You'll be paid. Physicians must also be trained. So you'll need to do it as well. Everybody gets uh, uh, CME with their training, so it's not a waste of time. Uh, physicians are responsible for the delegates training. So make sure you get that done. Uh, the site is online. It's always there day and night. Probably the best time to do it is for lunch. Treat your staff to uh, a piece of lunch while they get certified, uh, take their test, and, uh, and go on about their business. Remember, it takes about 30 or 35 minutes. You can look at a slide uh, view uh, session, or you can just listen to a faculty voice over presentation, which I think is a little faster and, and is good. You've got two choices. But go to smilesforlifeoralhealth.org. Make sure you register. You must register uh, uh, to take the test and to download your certificate. If you lose your certificate, uh, uh, for some reason, you can always go back years later and download it again. So keep your password. If you lose your password, it can be recovered. Very simple, very easy. So the state wants us to look at the teeth and send the kid, compel the parent to go see a dentist. They want us to educate and give anticipatory guidance. It's very fast, uh, doesn't take much, uh, and we tend to do it whenever we see the child. So anyway, uh, so it's very easy. Billing for fluoride varnish has to happen at the same time that you see and bill for the child. So it's gotta be done the same visit uh, and your bill has to go on the same uh, bill that you send for your visit, or they'll assume you did it separately and you won't be paid for it. What is the reimbursement? $24 and a nickel. Use these codes or you will not be paid for it. Very simple. A CPT code 99188, ICDM 10, Z41.8. Write these down now. Get certified today. 
get some varnish today, borrow some if you have to in your business. So you can do this uh, today if you wanted to. It's that quick and that easy. Okay, so how does fluoride varnish work? Well, it substitutes fluoride arms ions for calcium phosphate uh, and enhances remineralization. So on the test, this is the answer. It enhances remineralization. It has a am truly amazing safety profile. It's the safest thing we do and use in our clinics. Uh, many studies have been done that, that show this. Our experience uh, was the same as other uh, studies, especially one uh, in Colorado Springs uh, or rather uh, Denver in which they looked at 10,000 doses uh, that were given in clinics around their city, and they all had zero problems. Now, the conjugate indications are two, and just remember these. One is absolute if you're allergic to pine nuts, because the varnish itself is made from pine nuts. Pollen uh, uh, allergy is okay, so you can be allergic to pine pollen and still get your pine nut-based rosin based uh, or resin based fluoride varnish. The other contraindication is theoretical. Well, if you got some sores in your mouth, I think we'll not give it to you today, uh, just in the, the chance that it might somehow uh, irritate those sores. So fluoride varnish itself is almost always, I'm sorry, uh, 5%. And this is what you want to order, 5% sodium fluoride, okay? Uh, don't order any other percentage, uh, just 5%. So what is recommended and what everybody uses. It's in a sticky resinous base and has a uh, flavoring agent. Uh, you can get different flavors. We use bubble gum a lot. Strawberry is nice. Uh, you just simply quickly paint it on the teeth. Very easy, very fast. It's never been associated with fluorosis. Okay. If you draw the blood level, uh, uh, one or two days later, after brushing uh, uh, with fluoride toothpaste, you get the same concentration of fluoride. That's right. So after you put the fluoride varnish on, you draw blood levels. One or two days later, the concentration you find will be about the same as you get after you brush your teeth with fluoride varnish. Binds tightly to the surface and flakes off over the next couple of days. So we Ask the nurses to tell the patients, uh, uh, don't brush until the tomorrow, uh, leave it to bind well on the, on the tooth. It's okay to eat. Uh, it's uh, uh, best to stay away from uh, hard candy and things like that that might dislodge your varnish. But don't brush until the next day. How much does it cost? Costs about a buck. Uh, so shop around. Uh, a is about as good as B, there are many brands. Uh, multiple flavors. Uh, as I said, I'm partial to bubble gum. Uh, but strawberry is okay too. Uh, take your pick, try the ones you want to do it. We purchase these from dental supply houses. So uh, 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 it's just easy to do. Buy a small uh, quantity unit. Uh, you won't lose your money. I think you can get a, a box of 50 uh, unit doses and always buy unit doses. We'll see this uh, for about uh, uh, 30 bucks. And this is important shelf life, two years. No refrigeration is needed. So the nurses can walk around with it in their pockets very fast. And you can't lose your money if the freezer or the refrigerator uh, dies over the weekend. We do not obtain a specific informed consent in my clinic. Uh, for this, we use the global consent to treat that is obtained when the child comes into the clinic. And this is what most people do. But uh, you're welcome to get a specific consent if you like. But uh, we've never seen a problem with it. And I've heard of no, no difficulties with that. So this is what a tray might look like. Uh, you can use a mirror to look around if you like. We do not and did not. So that leaves us just with a sponge to dry with, our unit dose. Uh, package and some non-sterile gloves. So all of this we get for what, maybe a dollar and a quarter, uh, pretty cheap. So it's very simple to use. We use unit doses, always buy unit doses that had integrated brushes, not brushes separately in a box. They'll be on the floor in no time and you're left 
with a bunch of varnish and no brushes to use. You peel it back, very simple. Here's a little sponge that we use. We use this sponge uh, uh, that we typically call four by fours, even though they're not, uh, uh, to dry the teeth. The teeth need to be dried uh, briefly. Uh, we don't want them completely dry because a little moisture is needed to, uh, to set the uh, varnish with. Uh, and then we use our gloves to protect our fingers and the patient. Uh, very simple. Uh, when you first open your, your little well that contains uh, uh, the varnish, we swish it uh, a few times very quickly with the brush as the resin tends to separate, which is the reason you don't want to buy uh, uh, varnish uh, in a tube because it does definitely separate. Okay, now uh, I will tell you that uh, some people recommend the knee to knee position to do this. Here's a position doing this, but it requires setting up furniture and uh, uh, it's a bit messy. Uh, you'll have to wear protection for your clothes here. Uh, and although Gus does give you an excellent look at the teeth, you can do pretty well with a tongue depressor and uh, with your patient on the table. This is not a hole in his glove. Uh, people that do this all the time, the nurses know they will get a big glob of sticky varnish uh, and they will go back and forth between there and the mouth as needed to get more varnish rather than having to uh, reach or find their their little unit dose well. Works good. This is the way they do it. Uh, so swish, swish. Uh, if your child has only two teeth, it takes about two seconds to do this, obviously. Remember, we're painting the side of a barn, not painting a rim branch. So just swish, try to get the varnish on the tooth, not on the gums, although nothing bad will happen there. Uh, uh, and we're done. It's very simple. Parents like it, we like it. So start from the side uh, and do the sides first, upper and lower. Uh, we do that so we don't accidentally knock off varnish that we've already applied to these especially uh, sensitive teeth in the front that we wanna protect. Uh, fluoride varnish works best on these flat teeth. And Kaylee, uh, there are some folks that don't even recommend bothering on on the molars because it works less well on motors. Molars are because uh, they're deep, deep pits and so forth. But we put it on all of the teeth. Uh, remember, we're just painting the teeth. It's very fast, swish, swish, and we're done. We paint the front teeth last. You don't have to get them completely dry. Uh, we just knock off most of that saliva. You need a little moisture to get the resin to set. It dries almost instantly and you're done. Okay, does this stuff really work? You bet it does. There's a famous study in, in California uh, where they took about 300 children, made sure none of these children had any signs of tooth decay. These were all toddlers uh, and under. And they took one group and uh, they had routine care, but no fluoride varnish. The other half, the other group uh, had routine care and got fluoride varnish at various uh, frequencies. The group that got no varnish after a couple of years had over 40% carries. It's what we see in, in Louisiana. Uh, the group that got one dose per year uh, got half as many, almost half as many carries. The group that got two doses uh, got less. Uh, they expected to see a little better response here, but they discovered that Many of the kids who are supposed to get uh, two doses actually only received one in their study. And the few that got three to four just about had no, nothing going on here at all. So uh, yes, it's worth doing. We definitely want to do it. Uh, if you can find this, this is a study by Weintraub done at uh, University of California in San Francisco. Okay, so where do you get your fluoride varnish? Well, you can get all different name brands uh, and so forth. Cavity Shield, Clear Shield. I've used several of these. They're all pretty good. Try to get a cheap one, one for a dollar, sometimes even less. Uh, get them from Patterson, uh, 
uh, Henry Shine, Sullivan. There are many places to get them from. Look them up. If you have trouble, if they don't want to sell to you, call the representative. Find out who the representative is. Contact them. They'll get you uh, taken care of very quickly. Here's what it looks like. Unit dose, uh, unit dose uh, uh, is the way to go uh, with integrated brush. Don't get unit doses where the brush is boxed with uh, 50 other uh, brushes. Uh, within 24 hours, all of those will wind up on the floor. Uh, believe me, not the best way to go. So do you have to document? Sure, we document. We document when we do it. We frequently have a little code in electronic uh, records uh, that says what we need to say. Uh, but uh, it works well too. Uh, many folks will just get a stamp. We just need some easy way to show that we did it. And uh, we examined the patient. We provided a little bit of anticipatory guidance. We sent them to the, to the dentist if, uh, uh, if they needed uh, emergency care and we were done. Uh, so whatever uh, method you use in your clinic, uh, make it simple. Uh, simple things, things that are easy to do, usually get done. So uh, most kids tolerate this very well. If they seem anxious, uh, and we do this in uh, back to school clinics all the time, uh, just, just tell them that, uh, well, uh, it's like, uh, have you ever had your face painted? And uh, they say, oh yes, they brighten up considerably. Uh, well, we're gonna paint your teeth. And they relax and, and go right along with it. Uh, uh, infants are a little bit different, but nurses know in pediatric clinics very well how to handle that. And this goes smoothly. Now this child uh, is, as you can see, his lower face is happy to get uh, fluoride varnish today. His upper face is uh, undecided, I would say. Uh, but his mom had, and I remember this patient, had uh, a very poor dental history, and she wants her child to do better. So uh, this resident uh, at a back to school is going to do it. We train our residents uh, and have them certified. So if you get one of ours, they're ready to go. So who says we need to do this? Well, everybody does. Here's our periodicity chart. And if you look at the bottom of the chart, fluoride varnish is on there. The United States... Uh, Preventive Services Task Force recommendations are very clear, and we need to do this. Remember, our state pays for it for every six months. Finally, uh, here's the path for varnish application. Very simple. Do your smiles for life, oralhealth.org uh, quiz after your training. Get yourself some varnish, apply the varnish, and bill the same day. Uh, don't bill it later, must be done at the same time. Okay, so we need to do this for our kids. It's something really worth doing for kids. Fluoride varnish is like a vaccine for children. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, you won't be sorry. None of the clinics I've ever visited who started using this stop, except for one. And when a code changed many, many years ago and they missed it and they stopped getting paid. Everybody knows if you don't use the right code, you don't get paid. So use the right codes. Uh, I think you won't be sorry. Uh, your patients won't be sorry. Your clinic will uh, experience uh, in, an increase in value to your patients and your parents will, will love you for it. So please uh, write down this location. You can do this at home uh, and download your certificate. You're ready to go. Send those certificates to all your MCOs. Make sure you get everybody that wants it. And please uh, email me with any questions or if you need any help getting started at any time. I'm sure uh, our local chapter, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Julia and, and Ashley, who have been so kind enough to help us do this today, will be glad to help us out. Anyone still here has any questions? <laughs> People are still here. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat or share now. Ashley, did you have something additional? Uh, no, there were no questions um, in the chat. We did try to include some of the resources that Dr. B talked about throughout the presentation today. Know that we will share the slide deck 
along with um, a couple of other additional um, support documents for you. Um, and then the next step really is evaluation. So Julie, if you want to share that, and I will be putting the evaluation link in the chat.